I really wanted I really wanted to thank Brian here for coming, Dr. Brian Williams from Goddard. Um, he is I think he's our first true speaker that's here in person post COVID. That's not a Novak member, um, which is which is cool because we've come a long way from before before COVID, uh, where we did this routinely, right, every month. Um, it's it's taken a long time to get back to here. So I really appreciate Brian for making the trip over here. Uh, he could have done it virtually, um, and but wanted to be here. So it's great. Um, Brian's uh, work, working up at the uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center. He's an astrophysicist, X-ray astrophysicist. Um, he studied at uh, North Carolina State uh, University, where he got his PhD in physics. Uh, he also spent time at Florida State, uh, also studying physics. Um, so um, uh, great background. He spent some time at the Space Telescope Institute up in Baltimore, uh, working both Hubble and uh, more recently Webb, correct? And, uh, and he's now working on a program called Prism, mm -hmm. which is about to launch. Um, and he's going to tell us about that. But um, so it's great to have you, Brian. And I'm eager to learn about supernova. They're one of the most beautiful things to look at. Um, and uh, you can tell us what they are and how they got to be that way. So welcome, uh, Dr. Brian Williams. Um, well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, George, for the invite. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be the first speaker, postcode, all the other qualifications you had. Um, great turnout. Um, I see a lot of folks on. Uh, I have a lot to cover in this talk. I think I can get through it all in an hour, but it's sort of uh, ping pongs around the various things. I have some science. Uh, I have some history of astronomy. So thank you for the introduction there with historical work. I have some technology development that we're doing at NASA. Uh, and I'll tell you about the next, the next big thing that's coming in NASA astrophysics. Uh, so I like to start off with uh, non-controversial things. Um, I start off with things like the sky is full of stars. So I think we would all agree with that. Uh, in general, stars don't change a lot. Um, that's kind of a useful thing. You know, if you were a navigator at any time in human history prior to very recently, it's a very useful thing to go out at night and see the same stars. Uh, they do actually change a little bit, though. Uh, and occasionally, it's this, this happens. I'm sure most of you have seen this Time magazine cover from uh, 1987. Uh, it's the famous uh, supernova of 1987A, uh, discovered in February 23rd uh, from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, this was a, obviously a, a huge event. It's the closest uh, supernova in hundreds of years. Um, it's not the first one that we've seen from Earth with the naked eye, and I'll actually talk a little bit about some of the ones that we'd seen before. But it was the first one in an awful long time and obviously made, you know, the cover of Time magazine a uh, very big deal. So supernovae, uh, I'll just give you a very brief overview. Um, they are very rare events. You know, a galaxy is 100 billion stars or so, and maybe once every 100 years, one of these stars will explode on average. Uh, they are, however, very bright. Uh, someone mentioned earlier in the slide you were showing that on average, a supernova does rival at the brightness of the entire host galaxy for a few weeks. So a single event is uh, as bright as 100 billion stars or so. But in general, we still need telescopes to see them. Uh, now I'm going to give you some examples later in the talk of times where we have not needed telescopes to see them. But in general, you know, we still do. Uh, but they don't simply dissipate away after a few weeks. Uh, the remains expand for thousands of years, maybe tens of thousands of years, uh, depending on the ISM conditions. Uh, they make these beautiful objects uh, called supernova remnants. Uh, that's, that's mainly the focus of my research is in the, uh, the remnant uh, aspect of supernovae. Uh, they tend to be very bright objects in x-rays, um, and I'll, I'll get a little bit into the... Uh, later on, I'll get more into why that is, why are they bright in x-rays. But it's hard to overstate the amount of energy that's released when a star explodes. Uh, as I said, they are... Uh, they uh, are about as bright as the entire galaxy uh, for a few weeks. Uh, some of you have probably seen this uh, cartoon before. I'm sure some of you are at least familiar with the online cartoon of XKCD. Uh, he did a thing a few years ago where he ran some calculations and said, which of the following would be brighter in terms of amount of energy delivered to your eye? A supernova if the sun exploded at the 93 million miles away, or if you had a hydrogen bomb pressed against your face? And the answer is it's actually not even close. It's still the supernova. They're incredibly energetic events. They kind of have to be to, see, to be seen from halfway across the entire universe. So 
Why are they important? Uh, I think you all have probably seen this quote before. It's one of the more famous quotes in astronomy uh, by Carl Sagan that we are made of star stuff. So supernovae are the primary thing that's responsible for seeding the cosmos with elements. If stars never exploded, the universe would be a very boring place. Stars are great, but they're just giant balls of hydrogen fusing into helium. Most of them stop there and kind of don't do anything else. A uh, few of them go a little bit higher than that on the periodic table, but none of those elements would ever get out uh, if the stars didn't explode from time to time. So most of the heavy elements that are, you know, part of our, our uh, bones, blood, um, earth, everything, uh, are, are the results of um, supernovae that exploded uh, well before the sun even existed. So the statement that Carl Sagan made is, is not, just a, not just a poetic statement, it's literally true. The atoms inside of us were once inside of uh, stars billions of years ago. So what do they actually look like? Uh, this is sort of an old figure, but it still works. Uh, these are some Hubble images of before and after uh, supernovae. So in the, the, the row on top is all before, so these are distant galaxies. Uh, afterwards, you see the, the uh, point source that's there that wasn't there before. Uh, we saw some images early on. I didn't know you were going to show those images, but those are really cool. Um, one of the things that I thought was really cool is that we've gotten so good at detecting these now that the entire field has changed from a few decades ago. Uh, 1987A was discovered on February 23rd. The supernova naming system goes, you know, year that it's discovered. The first one is A. Second one is B, the third one is C, and so on. When you get to the end of the alphabet, you go A, A, and A, B, A, C. You keep going. When you get to the end of that, you go B, A, B. You get to the end of that, you just add a third letter. So you just keep going. So the one you showed earlier, you remember the uh, number? It's 2022 HRS. The date was April of 2022. In 1987, it took till February 23rd to get A. So we're detecting these thanks to robotic surveys, thanks to uh, telescopes like this that just scan the skies. And this is about to get even better. Uh, the Rubin Telescope, formerly known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST, is probably going to take us from thousands of these a year to millions of these per year. It's actually going to be a huge, a huge problem in some uh, some ways of how do we actually uh, determine what's what's interesting and what's not. Yep. Yes, the year we see it on Earth. Yep. <laughs> yep. That 2022 one was probably several hundred million years ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, with that said, so here's a list of the supernovae in modern times, nearby being in our galaxy or in the uh, you know one of our satellite galaxies. Uh, obviously, we start with 1987A. This is a very famous Hubble image. Um, number two on the oh, no, sorry. That's the end of the list. We have not had a supernova in the nearby universe, nearby being the Milky Way galaxy or the Magellanic clouds or any of our dwarf galaxies around us uh, since the invention of the telescope, 1606. The number of supernova remnants, though, in the Milky Way galaxy is hundreds. Um, with something like 350, it grows from time to time when we discover a, a new faint one. Uh, but it's obviously a lot of these that we can study now and learn more about what went on, even if we can't be close to a supernova. Um, every astronomer hopes that the next galactic supernova goes off in our careers. Um, people have been hoping that since, you know, 1604. Um, so maybe Betelgeuse will go off next year and we'll all be happy. Uh, so just the quick anatomy of a supernova remnant. Um, you know, again, you have this massive explosion going off in space. Uh, this sends a shock wave out into the interstellar medium. This shock wave is moving at thousands of kilometers per second. Uh, if you prefer miles per hour, I guess that's like millions of miles per hour or maybe hundreds of millions. I don't know. We can do the math afterwards, but it's very fast. Uh, these shock waves, you know, you run a shock wave at th th several thousand kilometers per second into the gas and dust and things that are in the ISM. It heats them up to very high temperatures. It heats them up to millions, tens of millions of degrees. I said earlier that these things are very bright in x-rays. That's why. They're simply too hot to emit a lot of optical radiation. Uh, the famous ones that you've seen, the Veil Nebula, um, things like that, those are very old remnants that have actually cooled down to the point where we can see them uh, in the optical. Uh, when they're young and bright uh, and fast, they emit mostly in the x-rays. So that is actually an x-ray image on the right uh, of a remnant that fits very well with this cartoon image on the left. So I like to show this one. Um, you have the outer parts here that are dominated by the stuff that's been shocked by this blast wave that's going out and expanding in space. 
eventually that blast wave slows down and just like a line of cars on the freeway when the first guy puts on brakes everybody else has to afterwards you actually get a reverse shock wave that propagates in that actually heats up the stuff that was part of the star itself so that blue stuff in the center there that is almost entirely iron and silicon that was part of that star uh, when it exploded this was a type 1a supernovae uh, very heavy in uh, silicon iron sulfur um, some oxygen a supernovae uh, but this is sort of the basic anatomy here so you sort of have this this structure of outer rim of shocked material that was in the interstellar media inner uh we call it the ejecta so this inner region of heated ejecta that uh that oftentimes separate themselves out uh, just like this yeah so are all supernova does the shock wave travel at the same speed or does it vary from one to another it varies and what else, what's so either the energy of the explosion, that's a big one. Um, they are not all the same energetics. Uh, they can vary by a few orders of magnitude. I mean, they're all they're all very energetic, but there's a difference between, you know, a normal supernova, a superluminous, a subluminous. Um, the other thing that can uh, affect this a lot is the density of the surrounding medium. So, you know, take one explosion and another explosion of the same energy, but one of them explodes into 10 times more dense uh, surroundings it's just going to move a lot slower so there's not as much variation as you might think given those parameters but you know a standard number we always kind of quote is around 10,000 kilometers per second for a very young supernova and it can vary within a factor of a few of that but it's not like there are ones that are a hundred thousand and it's not like there are some that are five you know it's all in the few thousand kilometer per second range um, when they're very young now as they evolve it it you know, eventually it goes down to basically zero. So it's just a question of how fast does that happen? And is that something that you have theory where you could compute or estimate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we do. Um, we actually, I mean, you can do it simple analytical um, approximations. In fact, the uh, really you can, the only variables that matter are the energy that goes in, the density of the surrounding medium, uh, the time. And then from those, you can actually write down these uh, very simple analytical approximations. Now, those aren't perfect, but uh, those were done. A lot of that work was done back in the 40s and 50s. Um, in fact, well, I wasn't going to go off on this tangent, but since you since you asked, there's a famous um, story in astronomy that uh, I, I think it was, I think the guy, I think it was Setoff was his name, who looked at, uh, in World War II, um, there were pictures of an atomic bomb test that were published in like the New York Times. And they had pictures at several time frames and they were labeled the times he looked at that based on the time that you know the mushroom cloud is this big at this time then it's this big at this time and this big at this time and worked out what the energetics of the nuclear explosion were and the government got very upset about this because that was considered very classified information um, so they stopped publishing those pictures in the new york times we can do the same thing for supernovae so here are a few examples of what they look like. These are, you, as you can see, they, they're they not pen tennis balls. You haven't seen one, you've seen them all. Uh, they're very different. I'll get into a little bit about what makes them different. Um, these are all X-ray images. Again, I'll get into uh, uh, later a lot more about X-ray astronomy. So I thought it might be fun to talk about some of the uh, historical supernovae that we are relatively certain. We have historical records for, as in humans saw it, wrote it and we have a uh, a remnant there today that we can go look at so the first one um in 185 a.d uh, chinese astronomers noted what they call a guest star in the sky uh, it was recorded near the modern constellation of circinus uh, which is somewhat near alpha centauri uh, it lasted for at least eight months there's actually some difficulty with the translation of is it eight months or 20 months but it's at least eight months we're certain on that uh, before fading away it was too far south to be observed from europe so the chinese record is the only existing documentation of this we believe we're not 100 percent certain but we have relative certainty that this was the first example of a historical supernova today if we look at that part of the sky <clears throat> we see something that looks like that so that is a supernova remnant. Uh, it's called RCW 86. The RCW is just a catalog um, from an H alpha survey in the 60s. Uh, that's what it looks like today. And we believe that is probably the remnant of the star that exploded about 1800 years ago. Um, this is actually a composite image in x-rays uh, and infrared. 
Um, if you just look at the infrared, uh, it looks something like that. So as I said, the x-rays come from the hot gas and uh, that are heated uh, by the forward shock. Uh, the infrared actually comes from dust grains in the interstellar medium. So these dust grains, uh, they don't feel the passage of the shock in the same way that the gas does due to the electromagnetics. However, they are all of a sudden immersed in a bath of hot plasma. They're just getting bombarded by hot protons and electrons. And these microscopic dust grains heat up to temperatures that we can observe in infrared radiation. So that's a uh, Spitzer image on the right. Uh, and on the left is combined Spitzer uh, and... Uh, Chandra and uh, some other X-ray telescopes. So in roughly 1,800 years, if this is the remnant, uh, this has grown to nearly 100 light years in diameter. So you can sort of do the ballpark math off the top of your head. Nearest star is four light years away. Volume goes as radius cubed. I mean, how many stars are inside of a sphere that's 100 light years in radius? I mean, it's hundreds if not thousands of star systems have been seeded just in the past 1,000, 2,000 years uh, by this supernova. And this happens, as I said, it's rare, uh, once a century or so, but the universe is pretty old. So over the course of billions of years of galactic evolution, every point in the galaxy has been run over by numerous supernova explosions. Uh, SN1006 uh, is one that we are, we are quite certain um, was a historical supernova. There are ancient texts from uh, most parts of the world that we have surviving at that point. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head what the declination is, but it was definitely visible in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, there are Swiss monasteries that have records of this. There are Korean, China, Japan records. Peak magnitude was believed to be about minus 7.5. We do have records from the time that it was visible during the daytime, so it would have to be pretty bright uh, to be visible during the day. Um, on the left there, you can see a possible uh, Native American rock art petroglyph uh, that some historians think might be this event. We're not quite as sure on that, but we do have a lot of records of this from various parts of the, of the world that pinpointed the location quite accurately. That's what we see today. Again, that's an X-ray image. Um, this thing is a few, about two kiloparsecs away, so I guess it's about 6,500 light years or so. Uh, the angular size of that is 30 arc minutes, so that's equivalent to the full moon. If you had X-ray eyes, you would just see that, the size of the full moon. Uh, SN 1054, uh, very bright new star seen on July 4th, 1054. Uh, very good records from China, possible records from elsewhere. Again, you can see in the bottom right there, there's a possible Native American cave drawing of this. I am not an expert in Native American history, so please don't ask me detailed questions about why they thought that one was. People who are experts have said that this is about the right time and part of the sky or something. You probably know this better as the Crab Nebula. Uh, as on the left, you see the Hubble image. Uh, the nebula contains a pulsar at the center. A pulsar is a, a stellar remnant uh, with about the mass of the sun, so about a million times the mass of the Earth. Uh, we always in the DC area say you could easily fit it inside the beltway that we're here. It's about 10 kilometers in radius or so. So very dense, uh, smash the entire sun down into 10 kilometers and you get a very dense object, very rapidly spinning. Um, gives off a nebula in x-rays as well. So that's the x-ray image on the right. I'm sure some of you have seen this uh, video before, but if not, um, this is actually a time-last video over several years of x-ray on the left and Hubble uh, optical on the right. Um, you can Google Crab Nebula video. It's pretty easy to find this. Uh, but that is the um, sort of disturbances that are being thrown off by the... Play that again. That's playing again. Anyway, like I said, if you haven't seen this, it's pretty easy to find via Google. It was a major, you know, release by both the Chandra and the Hubble Press offices several years back. So quite a cool thing to see dynamical astronomy. We usually think astronomy is a static science, but you can actually see things move if we just go back and keep observing things over and over again. Uh, Tycho supernova of 1572. This is a very well-documented uh, new star. Uh, the Latin title there, I won't read the Latin either, but it says, Concerning the star, new and never be before seen in the life or memory of anyone. Uh, Tycho measured the parallax and showed definitively that it must be beyond the moon and the planets. Uh, this was a very big event because some of those previous ones that we now know about, records from those 
didn't really survive the dark ages. I mean, people were coming out of, you know, books weren't really a thing. So at this point in history, a lot of astronomers, and especially the ones tied to the Catholic Church, really believed that the heavens had to be static. And this was something that really threw the uh, that paradigm into disarray, was when all of a sudden there was a star that hadn't been there before uh, showed up. So uh, I, I was doing some research on this. I got this off of Wikipedia, take it with a grain of salt, but there was a sentence there that said, Queen Elizabeth called the royal astrologer to have his advice about the new star that appeared in Cassiopeia, to which he gave his judgment very learnedly. Um, I don't know what he would have said about this, given that this was prior to the invention of the telescope, prior to physics being a thing. Uh, I believe he uh, lived, so she didn't take his head on the spot for uh, giving some answer. Uh, there is at least one uh, historian uh, who believes this is possibly a star referenced in the opening scene of Hamlet. So you can go back and read Hamlet. They talk about a, a new star in the sky. It might be this, it might not. Um, this is kind of cool though. The table here, it might be too small to read if you're at the back of the room, but these are Tycho's actual um, observations. You can see the dates from November 15th of 1572 to March 15th of 1574 uh, is when it was bright enough to see. And he was giving approximate magnitudes. He was giving, you know, equal to star, equal to this star, or that star in brightness. So these are from his, his actual records. So we have actually observed this many times now uh, with the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which is a high resolution uh, X-ray telescope. <laughs> We've also done it with the VLA. Um, this is a movie, and if you watch quickly, you actually see, I think this is a, a side effect of converting from Keynote to PowerPoint, but the movie is supposed to loop, but I'll play it one more time. It's only about three seconds long, but up in the top right, you'll see the years from 2000 to 2015. It's about a 10 frame movie or so, uh, but we can actually watch this thing expand. We can then measure the expansion velocities. We can backtrack a lot of the information you were asking about. Uh, we can work out explosion dynamics. Um, we can work out various explosion models, um, all sorts of interesting supernova physics that we can get out of this from you know, coming back to this thing every few years. This is the same thing in radio. Um, this one is looping, so that's cool. Uh, these are radio observations dating back to the 1980s uh, through about 2015 or so. Uh, again, same thing. We can watch it expand, we can measure velocities, uh, all sorts of interesting stuff that we can do with this. Kepler. So this is interesting. Uh, I gave this talk to the uh, National Capital Astronomers Club um, maybe a year or so ago. And while I was putting together this talk, uh, I had seen an article uh, that had come out in Physics Today, uh, coincidentally around the time I was doing that. And this image on the left is the one that if you go to Google and type in Johannes Kepler. This is the one that always comes up. It's now believed this is not a picture of Kepler. Um, I won't get into this. I'm not an expert. But the article was in Physics Today. You can Google. I just checked this today, by the way. If you just Google Kepler Physics Today, you don't have to put in quotes or anything. Uh, you can still find this, uh, this article. What is believed to be an image of Kepler is this one. So uh, hopefully someone's replaced the Wikipedia uh, image because that one was up there for a while. Uh, Kepler was Tycho's protege. Uh, he observed a new star in 1604. Uh, this is his the uh, you know cover of his book, I guess, on the new star in the foot of Ophiuchus. Uh, if you can see down in the foot there, there's an N drawing. N is for Nova, meaning new. So it wasn't there before, and now it's there. Um, this is what it looks like today. This is, again, the X-ray image on the left, uh, the infrared image on the right. This is the last definitively observed supernova in the Milky Way galaxy, 1604. Coincidentally, the telescope was invented in 1606, so just missed it. You wouldn't have really seen much different uh, looking through a 1606 telescope, but it is sort of an interesting uh, astronomical uh, coincidence. If you put all those together, it makes this beautiful multi-wavelength, multi-color image. Uh, there is a possible, Cassé is a very famous remnant. Um, it is possibly linked to a historical record. It's kind of dubious. In 1680, uh, there was a, I guess, English astronomer named Flamsteed um, who had some records of that, but it's it's not very certain. Cassé is sort of famous, though, for a lot of reasons. It's one of the most well-studied remnants in the in the sky. 
Uh, on the left, you see an X-ray observation from the Einstein Observatory in the 1980s. Uh, on the right, you see the first light image from Chandra in 1999. You can just see how much better that got. Uh, interestingly, when they pointed Chandra at it, that, that little circle there in the middle with the point, that's the neutron star that had not been known before. So the first light image of Chandra discovered the neutron star at the center of Cass A. Oops. Uh, and now if you point at it for a long time, so in the x-ray world, we use seconds uh, as our, you know, usually kiloseconds, thousands of seconds. Uh, if you point at it for a million seconds uh, with a very large x-ray telescope, uh, it's about 12 days. This is the, the beautiful uh, image that Chandra has produced. So I've mentioned uh, x-rays a lot. I've mentioned Chandra a fair amount. This may be a... Uh, this may be old news to some of you. I guarantee you it's completely unknown to some of you as well. Uh, how do X-ray telescopes actually work? How does an X-ray mirror work? Uh, it does not work the same way that optical mirrors work. Optical mirrors work on uh, usually normal incidents. Um, the old ones were refractors. Nowadays, most of us use reflectors. We just bounce the light off and it goes up to the secondary and then that bounces down the detector. X-rays don't work that way. They have a bad habit of going through things. So when you try to bounce an x-ray off of something, it usually doesn't do it. It is possible under certain circumstances, but we don't really do that. Instead, what we do is uh, we skip a stone off the surface of the pond. So we throw it in at low incidence, and it just skips along. And the diagram looks just like this. So at very low incidence, uh, as you see there on the bottom right, the x-rays will scatter down at a small angle. They scatter first off the primary, then off the secondary. And they go down to our focal point where we put an x-ray detector. So uh, x-ray astronomy is kind of interesting because every photon counts. We don't have nearly as many photons uh, in the universe as we do in optical and infrared. We can literally count every single photon that comes in. Uh, in fact, not only can we do that, but because we can, we can you know, time resolve each individual photon, we can get uh, the energy that it comes in with to some, uh, to some accuracy. And so, in fact, every X-ray telescope is also a spectrometer. So the same image that you see on the left, or, sorry, the same telescope that took the image that you see on the left, which is the Chandra X-ray Observatory, made the spectrum that you see on the right. Now, it's not a very good spectrum, but it's a spectrum nonetheless. Uh, you see the, the thermal emission from the uh, hot gas. You see these emission lines on top of it. Now, these aren't very sharp emission lines, but I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but every X-ray telescope is basically an integral field unit, which is the new uh, new thing in optical astronomy these days of putting uh, um, uh, putting integral field units into optical telescopes and being able to record spectra and images at the same time. We can do that in the X-rays because we can already see every photon that comes in and count them. So that brings us to uh, a new mission, um, a mission called CRISM, uh, which I have a heavy involvement in. CRISM stands for X-ray Imaging and Spectroscopy Mission. The goal of CRISM is to do sort of the opposite of what Chandra did. So Chandra makes these beautiful images, kind of ratty spectra. We're going to sort of do the opposite. We're going to make really nice spectra, maybe not so pretty images, but we are a spectroscopy mission uh, by design. So we will take a spectrum that looks like that. That's real data. This is a simulation. We're not in orbit yet. But we'll make a spectrum that looks like that. So there's a lot more interesting science you can do out of that than the one before. You start to resolve individual emission lines and absorption lines, and you can see how wide are these things. So what's the velocity structure of the emitting material? What's the abundances of the gas that's giving this off? So how do we do that? Well, I'll get to the technology in a second, but just a quick summary. PRISM is a JAXA-NASA collaborative mission. There's ESA participation as well. JAXA, of course, is the um, Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. We have two instruments. I'll, I'll talk about both of the instruments later. Uh, we are scheduled to launch fairly soon, uh, spring of 2023. Um, I think I can officially say May is our target launch month now. So hopefully, if everything goes well, three or four months from now, uh, we'll be in the sky uh, making spectra like the one you just saw. Uh, we'll be launching from Japan on an H-2A rocket. Uh, the mission is to recover the science that was lost with a previous uh, mission, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we'll have a nine-month calibration and performance verification phase. And after that, the rest of the mission will be run as every 
NASA uh, astrophysics mission is, that it's a general purpose observatory for astronomers around the world. Uh, we hope to last for many years. Uh, our nominal mission lifetime is three years. We have every reason to believe we will exceed that uh, if everything goes well. So I mentioned a previous mission. Uh, we have done this before. Um, I've actually tried it a few times before, but I won't go into all of those. Uh, the previous mission that launched in 2016 was called Hitomi. Uh, unfortunately, Hitomi was lost about a month in due to various mishaps uh, that happened. Uh, day 38. Um, prior to that, it had been working perfectly. I'll even show you some real data from 2016 that we got from that mission. Uh, even with a few weeks of operations, um, we got something like half a dozen targets observed. Uh, nowhere near at the level that we wanted to observe them at because we weren't even sure where we were pointing still. It was still working on attitude control at that point. Uh, we had over a dozen scientific papers come out of just those few weeks uh, of observation. And we got a brief glimpse, uh, as I'll show you in a second, into the power of high-resolution X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, it really is a transformational leap forward, so transformational that despite this mission being lost, um, the president of JAXA flew to Washington, D.C., met with the NASA administrator, met with various folks, um, said that JAXA's highest priority in astrophysics was to rebuild this mission. They wanted NASA's help again. We agreed to do it. And as I said, if all goes well, we'll be uh, launching in a few months from now. So why was this so transformational? So this is, a, this is an optical image. It's not from a supernova remnant. It's from a galaxy cluster. It's the Perseus galaxy cluster, one of the most well-studied nearby um, massive clusters of, of hundreds of galaxies. This is an X-ray image of what it looks like with Chandra. So in the X-rays, you can see the hot gas. You see this hot gas on hundreds of thousands, uh, millions of light years across, just sloshing around turbulent motions. We looked at this with Hitomi, and that's not a simulation. That's the actual spectrum that we got from it. Uh, to put that into perspective, how good of a spectrum is that? This is a zoom up of the uh, this bright this bright big line out here at six and a half. I know it's hard to see the x-axis there. Uh, that's a very well known line from iron, a uh, highly ionized iron, ubiquitous throughout the universe. If you zoom in on that, uh, it's a little hard to see on the dark screen. I should fix those colors, uh, but the dotted red line there below. That's the previous best spectrum that we had of this object in the X-rays. So we're basically two orders of magnitude sharper. So it's literally like going from, you know, the Einstein image that I showed from Casse in the 80s to Chandra images. That's the same as doing that in the spectroscopic domain. So we'll be able to do all sorts of science here. Um, I don't know who said this. Every time I look it up, it's just attributed to some astronomer said. Uh, someone once said, if an image if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a spectrum is worth a thousand pictures from the amount of science that we'll be able to get out of this uh, as compared to just being able to see the object. Here's another way of showing that. This is the same data I just showed, that iron line. Uh, here it's actually much clearer to see. That blue line below it, the one that says Suzaku CCD spectrum, that's the previous best spectrum we had of this object. So we'll do all sorts of physics uh, within this that we could not do before. Uh, we used this to get some results already. We used it to get a measure of the turbulent pressure in the gas in the cluster and compare that to the thermal pressure. Uh, really remarkable what we can do. We can even take that and make maps uh, that show the three-dimensional sloshing of the gas. So this is just the red shift, blue shift. Where you see red, that's the gas that's moving away from us. Where you see blue, it's gas that's moving towards us. Uh, the scale bar on the right uh, is in... This is from a press release, so they put it in, you know, miles per hour, kilometers per hour. Um, but the gas, gas is moving at, you know, 200,000 miles an hour or so um, in this direction. And so we can, we really get a much more complete picture uh, of the astrophysics that's going on here from something like this. So how do we actually do this? <clears throat> um, how do we make high-resolution X-ray spectroscopy? Well, we use something called a microcalorimeter. In this diagram, it's called a single photon calorimeter. It's a really simple design. It's so simple, I, I can explain it. Um, it's a little bit harder to build, but it's very simple to describe. Uh, basically, all it is is you take, a, you take an X-ray detector, you make it really cold, and when every photon comes in and hits it, it heats it up. And we measure that heat gain from a single photon. 
And from that, we can backtrack how much energy the photon had. What it actually does is it makes a plot like that at the bottom left. Um, we're sitting there at uh, 50 millikelvin. We are 50, 51 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. A photon comes in and it all of a sudden heats us up and then it cools back down. And we can follow that for each pixel on the detector uh, and backtrack out the energy. Now I said we have to be really cold for that. Uh, 50 millikelvin is much colder than outer space is. So if we just put ourselves in a space and didn't do anything, we would be way too hot to operate. So space is way too hot for us. We actually have to take a refrigerator into space. A little more complicated than the uh, refrigerators in our kitchens. Uh, it's actually four stages that get us down from four Kelvin, which is where liquid helium starts. Uh, we do something called adiabatic, adiabatic demagnetization refrigeration. I won't go into the details, what's but we have a four stage. Hmm? What's the time constant? The time. How long is that blip? Oh, that blip, uh, tens of milliseconds. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we have a four-stage refrigeration system uh, that gets us from 4 Kelvin down to 50 millikelvin. Uh, we have a lifetime of three years of helium on board, uh, but we actually have uh, the capability, once the helium runs out, we can do the entire cooling process mechanically. It costs us a little bit of operational efficiency, but we can actually last indefinitely on purely mechanical cooling with no cryogen. It's just the cryogen gets us there a lot faster if we don't have to do the entire thing with pumping. Are you going to have to be out in L2? Like, uh, nope, we're in low Earth orbit. Really? Yep. Low Earth orbit um, launches from Japan at 31 degrees, so we'll be in a 31 degree inclination, 575 kilometer orbit. Uh, so what does this actually look like? So we built this at Goddard. Uh, we had two main contributions to CRISM. We built the main detector and we built the x-ray mirrors. I'll get to the mirrors in a couple of slides. That's what it looks like, an image on the top left. It's a six by six pixel array. Like I said before, not great images if only six by six, but we'll get a little bit of imaging information. Uh, that's one of our technicians in the bottom left holding the thing up. Um, it's about the detector is about the size of your pinky nail, maybe a little bit smaller. Uh, those pixels are 30 arc seconds on a side. Uh, we have about arc minute imaging resolution, uh, but they provide us with that very high resolution spectroscopic capability. Uh, we finished these in December, or, uh, November of 2019, just before COVID hit. Uh, we shipped them out to Japan. Um, it actually left on on November 11th on Veterans Day. It got on the United Flight 804, which some of us know very well. The, Bell us to the reader out uh, with several of our people uh, on board with it. So this is a movie, I think. Yes, this is a movie starting with the real image of the hardware, kind of zooms into a cartoon version. But what you see is the photons will come in, they'll hit our detector, they'll heat it up, and it cools back down. Um, this is not at real speed. As I said, you asked earlier about the time constant. This takes tens of milliseconds or so for it to heat up and cool back down. Um, and the photons come in a lot faster than that. They come in at practically the speed of light. <laughs> um, we also have a very low background, thanks to the fact that our detector is very cold. Uh, we, can't we can't prevent, though, cosmic rays from streaming in. Um, those will light up our CCD just like a photon will. What we can do is we can put an anti-coincidence detector behind it that if a charged particle comes through, It'll, it'll light up the detector, but it'll also go through it. And so we can tell what's a photon and what's not. So we can throw out all those bad events uh, that aren't photons to make sure we're just getting the photons that are coming from the source that we're looking at. What about neutrinos? Can you... Neut uh, what about neutrinos? Uh, neutrinos don't interact with this. Which, like anything else, neutrinos just kind of stream through everything. In fact, the only neutrino detectors we know how to build are these massive uh water tanks and like the south pole they're huge and we get like you know one neutrino every so often so no we don't have to worry about those thankfully just the charged particles ah that's a good question that does happen for very bright source that is possible um can you repeat the question yes the the question was how often do we have more than one photon hit at either the same time or close enough to the same time where it hasn't cooled down uh, that absolutely can happen. Um, we have sources, just like every uh, every you know astronomical telescope in space 
has things that are just too bright for it to observe. So there are sources in the sky that are just going to be too bright for us. Thankfully, not that many. Um, and we have some, we're working on some mitigation techniques. We have some filters we can put into place. Uh, we might be able to point off the field of view and let the scattered light from the PSF come in. Um, so we're working on that, but it is a it is something that can't happen for very bright sources. Now, bright's got to be like the Crab Nebula or something like that. Um, this is a uh, picture um, from the entire, basically what you see at that, that hole at the center. So the, the x-rays come in there, the detector, again, the size of your pinky nail, sits down at the bottom. This entire thing is about this big around. For those online, I'm putting my arms out about a meter uh, across. Everything you see here is part of that cooling system. So this is all refrigeration to get us down to the temperature that we need to be. Uh, here's some pictures from, uh, from Japan. Uh, you, you can sort of see, actually, you'll get a better view in the next one of how big it is, but you can sort of see from the, the people that are standing there. Uh, this is the doer that the entire thing is held in. Again, it's about a meter or so in diameter, probably about five feet tall, I would guess, about this tall. Um, the instruments on board, I already talked about the first one, the uh, spectrometer, we call that one Resolve. The other one is called Extend. Uh, Extend is a very wide field of view, uh, almost 40 by 40 arc minutes, which in the in the uh, astronomical world from space, that's absolutely huge, trust me. If you've seen images from Webb, uh, Webb's field of view is like one by two arc minutes. So we're like 40 by 40, so this is absolutely huge. Uh, that's 1006. I mentioned earlier, it's the size of the full moon, so we would actually be able to fit that entire thing within one uh, field of view. Uh, we are, again, not a high-resolution imaging instrument. We'll have about arc minute uh, spatial resolution, uh, but we will have a very large field of view, uh, reasonable collecting area, so the ability to get very, very large images uh, of the X-ray sky, at least. Uh, I mentioned earlier the X-ray mirror assembly. This was also built at Goddard. Uh, the grazing incidence mirrors that I showed earlier, this is what they actually look like. And I need to get a higher resolution version of this image. It's a little hard to see, but you can see there's actually nested shells on there. There's about 200 of those shells built up. So we can do a little quick math. I could get the marker out on the board, but I think we can do it in our head. We build these in quadrants. Uh, we build these thin uh, foils of aluminum, polished aluminum. We just put them on top of each other like that. If there's 200, there's 203 there, we'll call it 200. That's a quadrant, so four of those is 800 as a primary. Then we have a secondary that's just like that, so that's 1,600 foils. We have two identical mirrors because we have one for resolve and one for extend, so that's 3,200 foils. And about 25% of them, because we test every one, don't pass quality inspection, so we have to rebuild them. So we made about 4,000 uh, polished X-ray mirror foils at Goddard between 2016 and 2018, uh, fully assembling this mirror. Uh, this thing. When it's fully assembled, looks like that. Uh, I actually took these pictures when we were out at the X-ray beam line at Goddard doing some calibration on this. That's the full size of one of them. It's 45 centimeters in diameter. Um, you can pick it up. It weighs, I don't know, 30 kilograms maybe. Um, uh, both of these have been, that's actually an out-of-date slide. Uh, I said they're scheduled to ship to Japan. They are now in Japan. They have been fully integrated uh, onto the telescope. We take our flight hardware very seriously at NASA. We've even put on their do not drop, and we have a <laughs> container that carries these things. I don't know if someone did that at one point and had to be told not to. It's very common. Uh, this is the same slide I shared earlier, the Hitomi spectrum. What I didn't tell you was with Hitomi, we were still in the checkout and calibration phase when the mission was, was lost. Uh, we were not even up to full power yet. We hadn't even taken, we literally hadn't even taken all the lens caps off in a manner of speaking. We had filters that had not yet been taken off. So the Hitomi spectrum looks like that. The Chrism spectrum, uh, once we reach full power, uh, will look something like that. Where the line out here at the far right is exactly the same one you saw before, but all of these soft x-rays down to, you know, one KEV or so, uh, uh, we'll have um, we'll have collecting area there that we've never had before. So just a few examples of things we might see. Here's a simulation that I did of Tycho supernova remnant. Uh, that's the size of our field of view of Resolve down there in the bottom left. It's three by three arc minutes. 
Uh, we might see something that looks like that. So if you notice, those lines are much broader than the ones before. I did that on purpose. That's because I assumed, based on what we know from seeing the images of the Tycho expansion, we have a pretty good idea of what the shock speed is. We know what the plasma temperature is. So we know about how wide those lines should be. So I put that broadening in on purpose. And we'll actually be able to measure that, how wide those lines are, and get direct kinematic measurements of the hot plasma uh, in this remnant. Here is. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen M51 before. I hope you see it regularly at star parties. Uh, that's an X-ray image in the left of M51. Uh, on the bottom right, that's the real Chandra spectrum uh, of M51. So again, Chandra makes these really beautiful images on the left, and it's been a wonderful machine. Uh, but it has limitations in when it can do spectroscopy. Uh, that's the real spectrum. The simulation from Prism will look something like that. So we'll actually be resolving all of these lines that just sort of get blurred together at the current resolution of the current state of the art uh, of X-ray telescopes. Uh, another one, NGC 1365. Uh, this is a famous AGN. Uh, there's an optical image on the left with a, an X-ray inset on the bottom right. Um, the current spectrum that we have in the X-rays is up on the top right. We can certainly see some emission lines. We can see some absorption lines. Uh, but we will actually be able to see with CRISM, and obviously, again, this is a simulation, but this is just a hint of what it might look like. We'll actually be able to see uh, scattered emission off of the outflow. So this, this AGN is a black hole that's accreting material like this. Well, the X-rays also scatter off of that disk uh, and come out. And we've never been able to directly see that before. We've seen hints of it before, but we've never been able to directly see it like this. Uh, we think we'll be able to see direct evidence of this. So this is a slide that uh, is probably a little bit outdated, but I thought it would be useful to show um, how had COVID-19 impacted us. So as I mentioned before, uh, we delivered the uh, Resolve instrument in November of 2019. We had people over there uh, from NASA in Japan the entire time doing integration and testing. Well, then March of 2020 hit, COVID comes along. Uh, all our people had to immediately come back um, for a long time for about three months we were doing fully remote you know up all night during their day uh fully remote help via zoom i mean literally had zoom cameras set up as people were doing things taking data looking at it uh, we were eventually able starting about june of 2020 um, to get people back into japan uh, those of you who have been paying attention to you know various international restrictions uh, Japan was closed off to outsiders from March of 2020 until October of 2022. So we were able to get in there about two years before anyone else did. Um, it took enormous efforts, um, not only on NASA international relations, but the State Department in the U.S., the Department of Foreign Ministry in Japan. Every trip had to be approved. We always joked, it's not quite the emperor, but close. Uh, had to approve every trip of us coming in. Uh, for a long time, people had to quarantine two weeks upon arrival, quarantine meeting in a hotel room where they would just bring you food outside your door three times a day. Uh, and if you've been to Japan, not known for their large hotel rooms, I'll just leave it at that. So those people, I never had to do it. I've been there many times, but I did not. There was no need for me to go. I'm not really a lab person. Um, so those, those people really, uh, really went the extra mile of sitting in a very small room for two weeks every time they had to go over. Um, we are back to normal now. Um, most of us are back at work pretty much full time. Uh, travel is open for, for normal uh, business now. Uh, in fact, we held a science team meeting uh, there in December. So that was nice to be able to get back to that. <clears throat> uh, my time is almost up. So I'll just say if you want to learn more about this, there's a few different websites. There's a Japanese version. There's a, a NASA version. There's even a European one. They all pretty much say the same thing. Uh, and I will just end by saying thank you for having me. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. And uh, again, happy to be the first speaker in what three years or so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. yeah. I have a question. You didn't mention anything about basal juice. Uh, you know, they say the uh, already the thing uh, has started uh, it's on its way the lights start coming down and uh, 
Anything so the question is about Beetlejuice. Uh, I think the question was basically when will Beetlejuice explode? Um, I don't know. Uh, I know that I can guarantee it will be very soon on astronomical timescales. <laughs> now, does that mean tomorrow? Maybe. Uh, does that mean 100,000 years from now? It, it could be. We just don't know. We don't have structure at that level of detail to predict when a supernova will explode. It has been doing some weird things lately. Um, it had gotten, um, I if it was brighter or bigger, somebody in the room must know. Dimmed. Oh, that's what it yeah, was. Yeah, it was right. dimming for a while, like two years ago. I think it's back to normal now. Uh, but yeah, it's, it exhibits weird behavior. So some people have said, based on some models, that that might mean its explosion is imminent. But again, imminent in astronomy modeling is not the same as <laughs> imminent for the rest of us. Do you want me to call on folks? Or? Yeah, you can go yeah. ahead. Okay, uh, I saw you first. What kind of spectrum What kind of spectrum? There's all sorts of effects. I mean, that that's basically it right there. I mean, that's that's the spectrum from an accretion disk around the... Uh, now, this is an AGN, so this is a supermassive black hole. Um, you get them from stellar mass black holes as well. Sorry, I should repeat. The question was just what type of spectra do you uh, expect to see from uh, from accreting black holes? Um, so yeah, the answer is you can get both emission or absorption features uh, depending on where the x-rays are coming from. Are they coming from the accretion disk around the black hole itself? Are they coming from uh, further out in the torus region? The answer is probably all of the above. And disentangling those is gonna be a, a real challenge, but it is, something that you know in theory we can do if we have the high resolution spectroscopy and we can do the line kinematics that we might see different lines coming from different parts of the accretion disk or of the torus or whatever else uh don't i i don't do black holes but um the temperature i mean you're seeing it in the soft x-ray band of around a few kev so millions of degrees yeah it's it's not billions but it's not it's much much too hot to be seen in you know thousands of degrees so yeah millions of degrees or so um yeah can you elaborate on how you construct an x-ray power spectrum um, um from a two-dimensional array that's each l each uh, pixel is basically making a single uh, measurement I'm not sure what do you, what do you mean by X-ray power spectrum. Well, the spectrums you're showing yeah. are are energy energy spectrum. Yes, energy so spectrum, spectrum. Right. Each pixel or given photon is only making one measurement, correct? Of of a given energy at a given energy level. Well, heating up the the, the pixels to a certain level. Yes. Yeah. So that's one data point yeah. at one point in the focal point. When you show an entire spectrum, you've got multiple measurements yeah. and multiple frequency varying frequency of measurements. How do you get that out of the two-dimensional measurement? So the question is basically how do we um, how do we construct the X-ray spectra that we see, given that we're only measuring one photon at a time? Uh, the answer is very simple. We integrate for a long time and we collect a lot of photons. So even in a single pixel. Sure, we get one at a time and then we record that one and then a second or so later we might get another one so we'll keep integrating over that and we'll just build up uh along that entire band from we go from about 0.2 kev up to about 15 kev in the energy spectrum here uh we'll accumulate let's let's see it might be too far to go back but i actually had it on one of the one of my slides from percy has actually had some numbers here that are relevant oops for an energy spectrum like you're showing right now on the screen, yep. how long of a time would it take to actually collect enough uh, X-ray photons to populate that? Uh, so our, our observation times in X-ray astronomy are usually measured in kiloseconds, which are thousands of seconds. And usually we're talking of order 100 of those. So 100,000 seconds. So we integrate for a day. We might stare at a source for a day, sometimes longer. We might stare at it for a week. That, uh, oh, I think I just passed where I wanted to go, but I was going to show you. I think it's. I 
Yeah, here we go. We can we can do either. Yeah. We can do either. We can get a spectrum from East Pixel. We don't recommend doing that because it's smaller than the point spread function of the telescope, but we could do it. Most of the ones I'm showing are integrated over the entire six by six array. Here it is. It took me a while to find this. Uh, just this, just this part of the spectrum, just this, you know, 6.4 to 6.7 keV from Hitomi had 21,000 counts. 21,000 photons went into making that spectrum, and that was the integration time. There was, I think, it was something like 200 kiloseconds, so two and a half days or so of staring at that object to make that. I thought I saw that, yeah. And the, uh, tell me, um, spectrums that we collect there that we show display on the graph, <clears throat> they're not the one, it's the entire, say, however many arc minutes across. Yep. The field Three arc minutes. Not specific to one point in that way. Where this this spectrum that you're seeing here is from the entire square. I guess you can't see my cursor, but yeah, it's from that entire three arc minute on a side square. Um, now I did show here. Uh, this actually answers your question as well. We broke it up. Those are actually uh, two by two pixel arrays um, that we got the spectrum from each two by two pixel array and got the spectra out of that. And then we can get the red shift and blue shift of the lines to make that. Question. What, um, what are you are you going out of Japan because they're your partner or going to Japan? Uh, because they're the partner. I mean, it, it is. They are the primary. It's it's primarily a Jackson mission. Now we are a major partner, but they've spent more than fifty percent of the money. I'll just put it that way. Uh, so yeah, they built the they built the spacecraft. They're supplying the launch vehicle. So we ship the parts to them, then they do the assembly and launch it. Um, but the the turns out the um, the out the latitude of the launch site there is uh, comparable to what we have on the east coast. So the or the orbit will be almost exactly the same as if we launched out of Kennedy. Doesn't matter at all. I don't quite understand your telescopes. Uh, you referred to having a primary and secondary mirror. Mm -hmm. um, by the first image you gave showing the small angular reflections. I, I intuition is that maybe it functions more like a like a, I would use the word lens. The X rays are gathered to a point behind the device, the gathering device, mm -hmm. and you have a long focal length of that followed by a short focal length of that. Is that right? Uh, well, the primary and the secondary are right next to each other. Um, let me see if I have this. I want to repeat the question. So oh, so sure. Yeah. Sorry. Here. The question was basically. It's mirrors do the function of gathering the light behind the device. Mm -hmm. I would call that a lens, the whole device. So the question is basically, uh, are these are these uh, do these X-ray mirrors sort of function like a lens? Um, some people might push back on that, but I guess you can say it's an analogy to a lens. I mean, sure, yes. I mean, it's basically doing the same thing. It's focusing the right. Well, no, on ours, they're literally attached to each other. The primary and the secondary, aren't. there's not even a space between them. They're attached to each other. The focal length is 5.6 meters for this. So if the, if Paul was our, our X-ray telescope, Roughly that trash can would be about where our detector is. But the two, the primary and the secondary, they're both about this big. One's here and the next one's here. So it's two quick reflections and then down. Is there a flat curved? Well, the they're curved. Um, I guess you mean along this. Right. Yeah, they're both That's a good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. They're very close to flat. There might be a slight curvature there. Um, the X-ray mirror experts would yeah, know more about that. The first set are paraboloids, and the second set are hyperboloids ellipsoids. or ellipsoids. I think so, that's right. Yeah. So it's analogous to a Cassegrain. Yeah. In fact, we even except it's done. Yeah. In fact, we use the same terms. The same as 
we use the same terms, Casa Grain, Wolter, you know, whatever. Those apply in those apply in X-ray physics as well. So yeah. So I think you're right. I believe the first one is a paraboloid. I thought the second was hyperboloid, but I may be wrong. It's it's some shape, yeah. Everything. Yeah, I mean that's why I gave a bunch of different examples here. I showed I showed a galaxy cluster, I showed a remnant, I showed a sorry, the question for all mine was what type of objects will we point this at? Uh, I would argue just about everything in the universe we could point this at. Not the sun, but other than that, um, <laughs> but we can point it at other stars. Uh, there are stars that give off x-rays, um, young flaring stars uh, give off a lot of x-rays. Uh, so galaxies, black holes, uh, clusters, x-ray binaries, exoplanets. Uh, we won't image exoplanets the way that some telescopes do, but again, a lot of exoplanets appear around these young M-type stars. M dwarfs tend to flare a lot. Uh, if they flare in the optical, they probably flare in the X-ray as well. So we'll be able to observe stars like that and learn a lot more about the atmospheric conditions that these exoplanets might be encountering. So yeah, we are a general purpose uh, astronomical observatory. We're not built for any one specific type of source or anything, all of it. <clears throat> I know. No, I was just checking. So uh, if there are any folks online that would like to ask a question, please put that in the chat. Any more in here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're always thinking. The question was, are there any similar missions being developed or what's coming in the future after this? Uh, absolutely. We have all sorts of things on the drawing board. Um, right now, nothing is firmed up, but there are, <clears throat> there are missions at um, NASA and Europe and, and Japan, um, all of which will take this sort of technology uh, and, and go, you know, orders of magnitude beyond. So, for instance, our array is a six by six imaging array. Europe is developed, Europe and NASA together. In fact, we'll be building that detector as well. Uh, are developing a, uh, a potential follow on to this uh, that would have 3,600 pixels instead of 36. So, two orders of magnitude more imaging. Now, that's not going to launch until uh, late 2030s, probably. But if, if then, um, we'll see. But yeah, there's all sorts of things on the drawing board. It's just really a question of of money, of technology development, of political uh, will. <laughs> it's very difficult in the world of astronomy to be governed by year-to-year -year budgets when you have to think decades out. So can, to, we'll pull on that thread a little bit. You said there's a you're developing a, a thirty six hundred or a thirty six hundred pixel detector, uh -huh. and then you're talking about a decade long timeline to getting this new thing, uh, this new one up in space. Um, is the is the long tent in the pole technology that needs to be refined to a greater extent to be able to support the higher resolution uh -huh. and so on? Or is the long tent in the pole the budgetary mission pass that has to happen? Uh, so the question was basically for, for future mission development, um, is the hard part the technology or the money? I guess that's a fair yeah, way to summarize absolutely. that. Yeah, I absolutely. think it's some of it's some of both. <laughs> um, at various times in development, it could be one or the other. Certainly, early on, it's the technology. Um, we already have the technology. Now we're very close to it to being able to do that. So at this point, it's really a money issue. Now, if you want to talk about thirty or forty years out, then that's a technology development issue. Um, if we wanted to make you know, a mission like this, say, that had thousands of pixels on the detector and also was capable of imaging at sub-arc second levels, that's a technology development problem at this point. But technology is tied to money also. In order to develop technology, you need yeah, money for that as well. So I, I'd say it's both, and it can be more one or more the other, depending on where you are, depending on what you're trying to do. So if you had the blank check and could, uh, you know, you could... What what technology would you like to see developed that would push things forward 
So for those online, uh, I was just offered a blank check by. <laughs> did not get your name, sir, but we'll talk later. <laughs> so, so one of the big things that we're actually working on at Goddard right now is the X-ray mirror technology to do high angular resolution combined with high spectral resolution. Um, I think that to me would be the next big thing. We're we're making a lot of good progress. We're not there yet, but we're getting close to being able to do um, similar mirror technologies to here. It's not quite the same, but it's the same basic design of building up these thousands at that point of shells. Um, but that is both a technology and an engineering problem at that point. Solving the technology to do it once is one thing. Scaling it up to doing it tens of thousands of times over and over again to build up this massive mirror is an engineering problem as well. Both of those require money to do. So, you know, if I had a blank check, I'd probably do something else. But if you limit it to astronomy, X-ray astronomy in particular, um, I would love to see a lot more, a lot more money put into that. What's the, what's the resolution of the current 36 uh, pixel array we have now? The imaging resolution? Imaging about an arc minute. Yeah, arc minute. So the uh, uh, spectrum detector is a measuring instrument. It measures the spectrum to improve the resolution of measuring the spectrum of the detector. Mm -hmm which means that uh, it measures the temperature, the high temperature of uh, specific chemical elements of what the uh, detector looks at. Yep. What can be learned uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the remnants of uh, supernovae? By measuring those spectrums, what can be learned about uh, the supernova itself? Uh, yeah, so basically the question was, Say for with supernova remnants in particular, what what will this teach us? Um, there's a lot. I could give you an entire talk just on that. Um, I guess the short version is uh, we will learn three uh, much more detailed abundance measurements than we've had before. So we'll know exactly how much oxygen in relation to iron, in relation to silicon, and things like that. That will tell us a lot about what type of star might have exploded. Um, uh, the explosion mechanisms, the burning mechanisms for fusing one element into the other. Uh, we will learn a lot about the, um, just from being able to do simple things that we've never been able, been able to do before, like redshift and blue shift of lines will give us the velocity uh, along the line of sight. So we'll not only be able to have, you know, the image I showed earlier, the movie I showed earlier of it expanding this way. Well, that gives us velocity in this way and this way, but it doesn't give us this way. Now we'll just be able to do simple redshift and blue shift to get uh, three-dimensional velocity measurements, which we can tie back to specific explosion models for a supernova. Um, we'll be able to do line broadening measurements to get uh, temperatures uh, that way. So we'll learn a lot about shock physics. Um, shock waves are ubiquitous throughout the universe. We have a general understanding of how they work, but a detailed understanding we still don't know. Uh, how do they accelerate particles? Uh, how do they amplify magnetic fields? Um, there's just, I mean, I could go on, but there's all sorts of different things that we will learn um, by doing this. And by combining this work with previous uh, works, like with Chandra, where we see the high, you know, the high resolution imaging, um, we'll combine this with that to get more of a three dimensional picture. So how high of an energy? We'll go up to about 12 to 15 keV. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was actually labeled on this one. It's really hard to see those lines, but yeah, it's uh, iron 26, iron 25. Uh, there is, that's actually the nickel, that line. Yeah, that's, that's nickel right here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> how, how high? Iodine. Not gonna, not gonna what uh, what energy is that? What energy is iodine? Oh, I don't know. Probably much higher. I've not heard of the uh, those, those very heavy elements, they're also formed in super. Yeah. Yeah. One more quick question. 
uh, are all elements that we know generated in, in the supernovae or uh, in a supernova, or are there other cosmic events that uh, generate the very heavy elements? There are others. Yeah. The question was how basically was are all the elements generated in supernovae or are there other methods? No, there are others. Um, there's actually some really cool charts online. Uh, I, I don't, maybe if you Google something like periodic table um, creation of the elements, people have done really cool, like color coding the periodic table to what, like this element came from type 1a supernovae. This element comes from planetary nebulae. This element comes from cosmic ray spallation or something like that. So um, yeah, it, if you Google that, I'm, I'm positive you'll come up with some very cool things people have done. And of course, most of the matter in the universe came from the Big Bang, but that's because most of it's hydrogen and helium. Yeah. I know we talked about it, but that's going to stay most of our galaxy, but there will be other galaxy spectra within the space No, we will. I mean, the, the spectrum right here. Uh, so the question was, will we only be able to do stuff in our galaxy or extra extra galactic events as well? I mean, this is an entire cluster of galaxies millions of light years away. No, oh, okay, right. So yeah, not not every type of event in the universe we'll be able to see. So yeah, supernova remnants, those are pretty small scale phenomenon, galactically speaking. So yeah, we probably wouldn't see one of those. Yeah, exactly. So like I showed um, the image of M51, say. Uh, so we're not going to, you know, where was it? There it is. That one. So yeah, in M51, we're not going to see individual stars with a telescope like this but certainly larger structures super bubbles um where multiple supernovae have gone off and have created a huge bubble we could see something like that sure is there an intent to be able to respond quickly to the detected supernovae in external galaxies <laughs> good question so the question is about our response time to uh essentially transient events a, an interesting event goes off how quickly can we get on it um, we have a requirement of 48 hours. Uh, I believe we will, once we get on orbit, learn a little bit more about how our instrument works, um, how science operations work. My hope is we can get better than that, um, but we will be at least 48 hours. And a lot of that depends on, you know, um, where is the source? Um, are we over a ground station in a reasonable amount of time? We don't have constant contact. No telescope is in constant contact. So how frequently do we have ground contact passes? So think, there's things like that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we'll certainly be able to follow on pretty quickly to any interesting astronomical event that happens. Maybe not minutes, but you know, a day or so. <laughs> You talked before about taking these um, temperature component spectrum off of accretion disks for black holes. Has anyone looked at characterizing black holes using spectrum and being able to maybe put them into classes of black holes, like having common spectral characteristics? Uh, is it sure, sense? yeah, no, it is. Um, the question was about, you know, observing black holes and accretion disks. Uh, can we start to classify things like this based on their spectra? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something we do now. It's something we'll do much more accurately with this. Um, you know, astronomy fundamentally is a classification science. You know, before we were doing anything with telescopes, ancient astronomers were classifying like, well, those are kind of bluer stars and those are kind of redder stars. So. We still do the same thing today at a basic level. It's just that we try to put in a lot more physics behind it as well. So first we make the classifications and we try to figure out what the physics is going on as for why these things are different. So yeah, we will do that. Has it already been done? Yep. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? I'm going to keep you here all night. <laughs> 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 a couple more. Uh, yeah. I think that shows your look at a spectral fire with 23 electrons now. Is that right? Yes. That gets these hot spots. Can you figure that out? Yeah. In fact, uh, even more than that, um, the one I showed earlier, this is. 
uh, right here. This is iron. That's iron 25, FE25 up there. So, yeah. I mean, sorry. Oh, I thought I heard another question. Um, Siri answering your question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd love to know what Siri says. But, um, yeah, well, in fact, x-rays only come from highly ionized uh, ions. I mean, if iron, you know, iron 1 up through iron 20 or so is not going to emit x-rays. Yeah. Yeah, you got to get them down to the hydrogen-like or helium-like state to really see x-ray emission. I would think. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, the lines aren't separated. Uh, there are certainly a zoo of lines. Yes, that's correct. I mean, this is actually one line with, uh, so that's the forbidden portion, the resonance portion, and two intercombination. It gets into detailed atomic physics, but that's actually what we're seeing there. Is that's detailed atomic physics happening. Because that, that is technically one line, but it's it really has four different components from the various atomic energy levels. It's a little colder in the yeah, it can get very complex very quickly. Iron in particular is notorious for having thousands of lines. They're just not all the same level of brightness. Some are just much, much brighter than others due to quantum mechanical effects. Some energy levels are preferred, some are not. So, One more. Last call. <laughs> I think we swept through the chat room, too, unless somebody online added something. Um, so cool, uh, Brian. It was terrific having you. Uh, loved a lot. The, the pictures are great. The, the science behind it, the spectra. I mean, it's a cool job you have. You, you certainly share a lot with us. And uh, uh, this is not a blank check, but it is something <laughs> small for you to, to take away. Thank you. And uh, of course, you can put you can put our Novak cup next Ooh. to your prism cup and, and uh you know do real science for us but thank you so much uh, for coming brian and i also want to thank jonathan jonathan saldana here kind of pin, pinch hit for setting up the room helping us with it yeah. called him at the last minute because we were very close to being virtual only tonight so it's all because jonathan came in and gave us a hand so big, big yeah. thank you All right, so Novak members, lots of great outreach op opportunities coming up. Uh, sign up through Candy. Send me an email if you need to, but, uh, you know, get out there and, and share astronomy. So we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.